Well, you know, when I was at Morris Brown College, uh, I waited table uh, out at uh, East Lake Country Club, which was one of the most celebrated country clubs in America at that time. And uh, I was aware of the racism. We used to get off right here on the corner, right on the corner, off the bus. And if you got off that bus, you used black, you went to one of three places. You went out to East Lake Country Club to work, or you went in the back of some of these white folks' house to work, or you went to jail. A lot of times we'd be on the corner waiting on the bus, and if you walk across the street, the cop would come, nigga, where he got, nigga, you bet, you could, that. And I never did forget that. So uh, when I brought my family back to Atlanta and decided to give up uh, uh, science as a career and go into uh, uh, civil rights with Dr. King, um, I began looking for a, a home. I had these, these, these five kids, and we would looked all over Atlanta. What had happened here was that there, it was a big family conflict in the house that I, I purchased. It was only one other black that lived on the street. And that lady sold me that house for a price you'd never believe. It was really tough. The guy in this house, behind the house I purchased, he would call us niggas all day long. I remember one day he hollered at me. He, I had my wife, and my, I, I was a, a, a lover of yards. I had a most beautiful lawn, yard, flowers, people coming from miles around just to look at my, fly, my yard, uh, ex-farm boy. And I remember one day he hollered at me. He said, hey, nigga. And I had my wife in church. I was out in the yard working. My wife said, please, please don't let him get to you. Hey, nigga. And uh, ain't you that nigga, Jose? So I finally looked up and I said, uh, yes, sir, I am that nigga, Jose. He said, well, I, I, I want to tell you one thing. A lot of these white peoples are running out this neighborhood, because this really was an exclusive white neighborhood. Uh, running out, a lot of these white people are selling their home and running out this neighborhood because you moved in. I was the second one to move in. At that time, the Cab County was less than 2% black. And he said, uh, uh, if you start talking, he said, uh, I want to let you know one damn thing, nigga. I was here before you came, and I'll be here when you're gone. And I looked, I said, you must be going to be a long-living goddamn cracker. And my wife said, please, <laughs> she's out begging me because the kids was there. Baby, you're breaking every rule I have. What happened was, when they built East Lake Meadows out here, and, uh, People tried to get me to fight East Lake Brothers at that time. And I, I couldn't fight them because they were poor people. They were building these projects. But they put out here 900, they built 990 units. And it all but destroyed this community out here. Uh, you know, where if they had put 200 units, 200 and Buckhead around, we would never known they were there. But that 990 poor families, East Lake Meadows, the low rent housing project, became America's number one crime community. And it pretty much destroyed our community. Now it's really being revived, and I don't think nothing can stop it. It's become down. Again, it's becoming one of the most celebrated uh, uh, neighborhoods in these houses, selling for what is just totally unbelievable now. Baby, you're breaking it. I never believed that uh, I, because I didn't, I didn't see how one could, could be viable and relevant in civil rights and in politics at the same time. That's why Dr. King never would, would, would even think of accepting any type of a political position. But after uh, uh, getting into Atlanta and uh, blacks being elected and uh, uh, not seeing the change that I thought should have been brought about by black officials. I began to get more and more concerned. So I uh, 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 ran, the first time I ran, it was just a protest because this white candidate uh, was endorsed by blacks over another black. And I ran as a protest candidate and and uh, it was amazing. The little money I spent 
and the large amount of votes that uh, I received. So I finally decided uh, after a uh, while out here that I would challenge the, uh, our state representative. He was very, very popular, supported by big money. And I ran the first time as a write-in candidate and did fairly well, but the next go round I ran uh, uh, as a candidate, uh, you know, and I defeated this gentleman and ended up spending 10 years uh, in the Georgia State Legislature. And I was convinced, I was there that long, that one of the greatest political enemy of black people were the elected black officials up there selling out. And one day I remember that uh, we passed the bill, it was an insurance bill, and at that time you only had about 18 blacks in the general legislature, the Georgia legislature. And we passed this bill by something like four or five votes. And we were so happy because a bill that would help poor people. And the Speaker of the House, who presides over uh, the House of Representatives, called a recess. And just as sure as I'm born to die, those insurance companies went out in that lobby and bought off enough blacks. And we went back in session the speaker called the bill back up and the bill was defeated. And I jumped that day and cussed everybody out. And, and, and they said I was leaving. And I resigned from the Georgia State Legislature. Somehow or another, I got the uh, feeling that I could make a, a sizable contribution by being a member of the Atlanta City Council. And so then I ran for the Atlanta City Council. And really, I found bigger Uncle Tom's of the Atlanta City Council than I left up at the state legislature. So I gave that up. And a real conflict came out here. I only had one person on the DeKalb County Commission. And that commissioner was imprisoned. And I ran against the black candidate that the Pike Power Structure had uh, chosen. And I defeated him which made me the only uh, politician in the history of Georgia, in that sense today, that have held all three positions. I was a city council person. I was a county commission of state legislature. No other politician has ever been able to do that in the history of Georgia. Also, I'm the only uh, person in the history of Georgia have won a uh, 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 a political position in the state legislature from prison. Baby, you're breaking every rule I have. At the last retreat that we had with Dr. King, he enlightened us and he, he kind of made me angry because at that time I'd been in jail 85 times and I could name you some 15 or 20 or my friends had been murdered in these various demonstrations. And Dr. King kept saying to us, we have gone around the mountain long enough. Now it's time to come in and enhance the land. And I found this, I don't understand what you, was, you mean, Dr. King. I don't follow you. I get the impression you're saying, out of all the beatings and the jailings and the blood spilling, out of all of the civil rights activities, we have only been on the perimeter of the civil rights movement. And he said, Jose, you held it long, and I thought you could, but that's exactly what I mean. And he went on to say that uh, black people in America will never, never be free. Never. Just by wiping out racism. If black people wiped out every vestige of racism in America and totally integrated every aspect of American life, they would not be free. If black people will never be free, and he said it with such an emphasis, until we control our fair share of the economy, that our society was econ uh, economically driven. Uh, the politicians make the laws, and they implement, or they supervise the implementation of the laws. But these politicians knew what those boys with that money said do. And that's when he said that we must shift from uh, the civil rights uh, uh, demands and to the economic demands. 
He also said in that meet that uh, if I do not change, they are going to get me. But I cannot change because I know I'm pursuing God's will. And he said that when they get me, they're going to be very surprised because get me will not stop nothing. He said, that's what your, that what your, I want you all's commitment. Because the power to free black people is not in Martin Luther King Jr. It's in this team that we put together. And I want you all to promise me that if they get me or when they get me, you'll never let them break up this team. And I guess like Jesus was talking, he told us what they would do to try to break up the team after they murdered him after he was gone. He said, uh, they're going to try to give some of you all uh, the most prestigious and highest paying jobs in politics. Don't take it. They're going to try to give some of you all the most prestigious and highest paying jobs in private industry. Don't take it. They're going to try to get some of you all to start your own national organization to com competitive with CSC. Don't take it. And we promised them that because we didn't keep the promise because that's what failed SCLC. The person that was in King's inner circle deserted the organization after his death. And, uh, and that's what uh, made, uh, I don't know, uh, be honest about it, uh, black people today are worse off in America than we were 35 years ago. Because uh, not only have we not gained our fair share of America's economy, we have lost control of the economics of our communities. And that's across this country, not just in Orbit Avenue. It's true in Harlem. Uh, it's true in uh, uh, Boston, Washington. And it's been amazing to me that uh, uh, the white power structure, obviously, came to their senses. And, and says, stop repressing them, stop rejecting them, open the door and let them come on in. And black people unwisely throughout this nation went out through white America and spent all of our money. White America did not reciprocate, did not spend hardly any money in the black community. And the black community across America went broke. That's what happened to Orbit Avenue. And it's really pitiful that the blacks that we got in office in many cases, uh, they became uh, the house niggers, a uh, 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 product of the white power structure, which resulted in them becoming a bigger enemy to the people, uh, just as big an enemy, in some instances more enemy to the people, than his white, uh, their white predecessors. And that's why today it really hurts me the number of people died a uh, number of people died, black and white, getting us the right to register and vote. And the vote turned out, turned out to be such a negative to us. Evidence of that, uh, after we uh, got the, the voters bill and, and had scope and did all the register, registered people to vote, they elected a black mayor in, in New York, a black mayor in Chicago, black mayor in Boston, many cities. And today, they all again have white males because those blacks got in office and sold the black people out and became, well, the, 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 if, if you check, like in Atlanta, where they elected all these black officials, uh, it only result in economic growth for a black clique the black upper class, the black few, the masses became more poverty stricken than they were under the uh, white politicians. So it's been a, a hell of a, a, a tragedy when so many people bled and died to give us the right to vote. And the vast majority of the blacks that we voted in office became a puppet for the white power structure. You're breaking every rule I have. I, I really believe when Maynard Jackson first took office, 
I really believe he had good intentions. But after he got in office and served four years, uh, he and uh, his associates became money thirsty. And uh, the elected officials of Atlanta began to feed the black community economic crumbs. That major money went to those white establishments. And uh, I'm convinced that they promised Matt Jackson and his associates a viable economic future. But the mass of the blacks was left out. And the whites still controlled, I would say, 85% of the money that's made in the city. And it had been kept in line. It didn't change when Andy Young became mayor. And it didn't change when Bill Cameron became mayor. And uh, it has been hurting because you realize you never had a mayor in Atlanta that was raised in Atlanta. Every single one of them was migrants. And they didn't know how Atlanta truly became Atlanta. I don't guess it's interested, but uh, uh, the black community in Atlanta, Georgia, which for ages was one of the richest black communities in America, today is one of the poorest communities. Um, um, and, and, and it was done under a black uh, 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 dominated control administrations. If you go down there now, it's just hard for a black company to get a contract from the city. A few black companies, they pick just a few, and those are the ones close to the mayor. But the masses of black companies, they are totally left out. And it's a, it's a, 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 a plan program thing. It's not by accident. It is definitely by choice. And the black politicians, as I said, they have become an enemy of the people. I, I just, I, I just, because what I've been trying to preach to black people and they don't listen to me, it's all right to, to listen to these black politicians during a campaign period. But our roughest time with them should be once they get elected, until they serve that term, demand that they carry out those promises they made. And they, they just don't do it. Baby, you're breaking every rule I have. Atlanta truly amazes me. Um, they have uh, diminished the black economic power here. And uh, I just don't see blacks being able to to gain uh, any economic power in the white communities or white areas that would be any significant. For this, even today, uh, we, I said we had Auburn Avenue, blacks had Auburn Avenue, and the white folks had Peachtree Street. Auburn Avenue has been um, demolished. It's been economically destroyed. And it was not accidental, it was intentional. It was planned to destroy it. But at the same time today in Great Atlanta, the economic, uh, I'd say, center of Atlanta would be Peachtree Street. Auburn Avenue is gone. I don't know a black on a single brick. Not only a building, I don't know a black on a brick on Peachtree Street. And that's the problem with, with, with affirmative action. The blacks who got in office uh, and, and that's one thing that contribute to uh, politics being such a, such, so economically controlled. Almost, in instance, he who can raise the largest amount of money go get elected. And, 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 and that came out of uh, the money, out of the campaigns of black politicians. But black, I, I've been out there from the Congress down to the uh, uh, city council, 
black politics at this juncture of our life have been a great failure and a disappointment. Baby, you're breaking every rule I have. I believe in a lot of those old sands, I uh, sticks and stones may break my bones. Sticks and stones will break my bones. But just words will never hurt me. The flag is just, uh, just words. It's wrong. I'd like to see it's corrected, but that's a hell of a lot more wrongness in many other things than that flag. Uh, I, I just, I, I, I can't believe how easy it is to organize black folks to massively uh, demonstrate against the flag, but you can't hardly get in them to demonstrate against uh, all this unemployment and all these corporate executives, the, <laughs> the biggest enemy, or has been the biggest enemy, certainly these corporate executives, the biggest enemy of America today because they've closed down plants all across America and taking those plants to Saigon and China or Korea or Japan and having these products produced and bring the products back here and sell them for the same thing if they'd have made the products in America, that's the thing I want to fight. Uh, I want to fight uh, prisons are just, it's unbelievable how uh, uh, young men and young women don't have much of a choice other than to violate some law. They go to prison, they're treated like hell, they come out, they're right back in prison. One of the programs I'd like to start has been really worrying me. These young men come out of prison with these felony convictions and they can't find a job nowhere. They give them $25 and one suit of clothes and they're about ready to go to job, back to jail in 24 hours. But uh, uh, it's really sad how America is lying powerless companies like China to destroy the viable economics of America. Baby, you're breaking every rule I have. I'm happy because all through history, uh, individuals that made uh, uh, viable, relevant contributions the vast majority of them was never realized until after their death. I probably receive right now more credit. I probably got 500 awards around the country. So uh, I'm one of those Christians that believe that uh, my gratitude will come to me once I'm dead and gone. I'm not worried about uh, what they say about me here. I'm going to do what I believe is right and godly, irregardless what they say about me. You know, in this town here, they used to say I was the, the, I was the greatest thug. I was the biggest gangster. I was the biggest alcoholic I ever trotted, walked Atlanta streets. Well, they really began to understand now I was, it was nothing but prosecution. You know, they was, because I couldn't be controlled. And in Atlanta, you know, one of the things, there were two things that Dr. King wanted to do before he died. And he want, I mean, he seriously, he said uh, racism was an international fact. And the only way you could deal with it uh, is deal with it internationally. So he wanted to get all the African leaders to meet with the American leaders and let's have a plan, a battle plan to confront racism. The other thing Dr. King wanted to do to lead a movement in his hometown, Atlanta, Georgia. He never was able to lead a movement in Atlanta, Georgia. Every time we found a reason to come to Atlanta, like we went to Birmingham, like we went to Chicago, or Savannah, or Selma, every time he uh, found a reason to come to Atlanta, the black leaders would get together and write him a letter and tell them we do not want you in our town. His father signed uh, one or two of the letters. And that's when Dr. King, after he was murdered, I promised him in his grave, I was gonna lead a movement in Atlanta. So I became the demon of the century.